The U.S. Navy assault ship, the USS Macon Island, arrives to dock in Hong Kong on Friday, May 25th. The ship joins the amphibious transport dock USS New Orleans, which arrived two days earlier. The visit comes amid a seven-week standoff between Chinese forces and the Philippines over the disputed Scarborough Shoals in the South China Sea. China, the Philippines, and several other countries all have competing territorial claims in the sea, which carries $5 trillion worth of ship-borne trade annually and boasts 10% of global fish resources. The U.S. also claims national interests in the South China Sea and recently took part in military exercises with the Philippines to the anger of the Chinese regime. The USS Macon Island wasn't involved in these exercises, but Captain Pringle says the ship stands ready to ensure peace in the region. Despite the looming tensions in the region, some crew members with connections to Hong Kong are taking time to relax. But uh, growing up in the United States for so many years, not being back for about 15, 16 years or so, um, now that I'm finally back, I get to see my, uh, my grandmother, my uncle, my aunt, and uh, I, I miss them very much. So um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, love Hong Kong. The USS Macon Island was commissioned in 2009. The ship has a primary mission of deploying marine landing forces and a secondary mission of sea control and power projection. It is currently deployed as part of the U.S. Navy's 7th Fleet. Welcome back, everyone, to GGN. My website is ggnonline.com, and on YouTube, ddarko2012. My backup channel is ddarko2013. And uh, thanks to Spaceman for sending me that link. I kind of missed that uh, video, that uh, news story about another uh, ship and well, basically on China's doorstep. So. It says here, Taiwan deploys anti-China missiles report. They've been holding drills and other sorts of stuff, stocking up on weapons. It says here, uh, Taiwan has for the first time deployed cruise missiles capable of striking key military bases along the southwest coast of the Chinese mainland. Local media reported on the 28th. It says the mass production of these, uh, which have a range of 300 miles, has been completed and the missiles have come into service, Liberty Times uh, said. These Taiwanese experts uh, say that the peop China's People's Liberation Army has more than 1,600 missiles aimed at the island. Next up, we have Taiwan businessman jailed for spying for China. Taiwan's Supreme Court has upheld a decision to sentence a businessman to three and a half years in jail for spying for China, and a case local media says has spooked the island's own agents abroad. The court said that the Taiwanese agent uh, was turned by the Chinese originally. And lastly, Taiwan and China have spied on each other uh, since the split in 1949 after a civil war, which Beijing says the island is part of its territory, waiting uni reunification by force if necessary. Then we have counterfeit Chinese parts slipping into United States military aircraft, as a report. It says counterfeit electronic parts from China are flooding into critical U.S. military systems, including special operation helicopters and surveillance planes and are putting the nation's troops at risk, according to a new uh, U.S. Senate committee report. Then moving on uh, to a similar type story, researchers find vulnerability that could allow spying in Chinese chips used by U.S. Army. A team of researchers from Cambridge said that they found evidence that a Chinese manufactured chip used by U.S. Armed Forces cont contains a secret access point that could leave it vulnerable to third-party tampering. And remember, uh, in South Korea, that's that story that I covered where South Korea was actually uh, tr uh, training or offering classes for snoops, for spies, and they were being, uh, uh, they were being uh, basically referred to by uh, these professors from the schools and stuff like that. Now we have China targets immigrants on North Korean border. China has launched a crackdown on illegal immigration in its northeast region bordering with North Korea, states the press. So I saw this article, and then I found this article, which was U.S. forces spy on North Korea. U.S. special forces, the special forces, have been parachuting into North Korea to spy on the extensive network of underground military facilities. It says that disclosure by top U.S. commando officers, reminder of America's continuing involvement in the Cold War on Korean Peninsula and North Korea's extensive preparations for the conflict turning hot. But, you know, if it turns hot, it's going to be um, because the West wants it to. So, you know, they'll have a little false flag. South Korea uh, ships that allow themselves to get blown up or something like that or hit some, like, old uh, uh, mine from World War II, 
and uh, then they'll blame it on North Korea. They're also parachuting or dropping um, leaflets, propaganda leaflets, in, into North Korea as well. So, uh, next up, as commandos raid Tampa, U.S. State Department power to declare war. So it goes on and says, from a, a Wired magazine from the 24th of this month, Clinton goes commando, sells diplomats as shadow warriors. Clinton, wearing pearls and a silver and black uh, blouse, climbed the stage and began to speak, and soon it all made more sense. She had an idea to sell and to defend. She described a vision in which shadowy U.S. and allied special forces, operation forces, working hand-in-hand -hand with America's embassies and foreign governments together, play a key role in preventing low-intensity conflicts, and where prevention fails, the same commando diplomat team goes on the attack. So it says here from the Daily Bail, or Daily Bell, sorry. It happened again at the recent Tampa-based conference building the Global Special Operations Forces Partnership. The U.S. military staged a mock drill in violation of 130 years of posse comitatus, bars domestic forces from active use on uh, U.S. soil. So it goes on here, it says it wasn't just the U.S., some 90 nations supposedly participated in the drill, which aimed to rescue Tampa mayor, supposedly kidnapped by terrorists. Ooh, that's interesting, isn't it? Kind of like the drills that they do on skyscrapers where they're uh, swooping in with black helicopters, same special forces type deal, and they're, what, they're lifting the bankers, right? You know, a lot of these mayors, what, they're on CIA payroll, so it makes sense. They're, you know, got to get the, those assets out of there uh, when the crap hits the fan. And, of course, these people that they're saving them from, they're not people that were screwed over by them. No, they're terrorists. So there were helicopters overhead and a tactical assault showed up by water. It goes on and says, then these special op teams invaded a terrorist village, probably just a regular suburban, you know, neighborhood, like a cul-de-sac or something, near the convention center, rescued the mayor who said he was grateful. It says here, Secretary of State seemed to inform the conference that the State Department now had the unilateral authority to declare a limited state of war via an expanding liaison with U.S. Special Operation Forces. Here are some direct quotes. We created a new Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations that is working to put into practice lessons learned over the past decade and uh, institutionalize a civilian surge capacity to deal with crises and hot spots. And the two things, remember, they just this year, uh, in January, they created a Bureau of Counterterrorism, which is not that big of a deal, but also this stabilization operations kind of goes in hand in hand with what? With the continuity of government where uh, they would have self-appointed um, uh, rep representatives. They're not really representing you, I guess, if they're just picked for you. But either way, they're, uh, you know, this, this, this has to uh, do with basically an economic crisis or, quote, natural disaster, a continuity of government. So it says here, experts from this new bureau, and that's what makes sense with these people, you know, these mayors getting, you know, uh, rescued and, and bankers at tops of skyscrapers in the metropolis is getting rescued. That has to do with continuity of government to keep those important people that have uh, basically sold out their their people, whatever, right? Their customers or clients, you know, or their, uh, or their um, constituents. Basically, so they could have the same sellouts uh, continuing their little uh, government system. You know, because, you know, you're going you're gonna to have a lot of people that are going to be pissed off, right, during this. You're not going to be able to have, hold elections. You know what I mean? If you do hold elections, the powers that be, they're not going to get the people that they want to get in there. And that's, what, that's what's so important about this period that we're in right now, where they have to go through this transition period of collapse or even a slow collapse or transition period uh, with the economy, with society, with the police state and all that, where they tighten it up, uh, where there's actually, I think, there's going to be a little bit of a little bit of period where there's going to be free, a little bit more freedom or liberty, whatever you want to call it, you know, to be able to move about. And and so, yeah, I mean, with these whole election things, it's going to be a little bit harder for them to, to control all of the elections, especially when people are going to be sitting there, you know, think about it. They're not going to be using Diebel or whatever those machines for voting machines, Diebel. They're going to be using hand stuff, counting it. There's going to be less possibility for fraud. You know, and it takes a long time to get to where they have it in the United States where the majority of those politicians, they're sold out, right? There's only a handful of them, and every bill, you can see them, they're always in the nays. There's like seven of them, right? Uh, so all of them have basically just conceded to this new power structure, this shadow government or shadow elite, basically, that, that control Congress and all that. And it's kind of like that movie, that uh, show Jericho. You know, they had their own elections and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, the whole plan is, is during this transition period where they have this, quote, order out of chaos, 
um, event, whatever it may be, or events, where they're going to have their system already in place. Like the new government in Jericho, you got to watch that show. It just came in, right? The president wasn't elected or anything. And he just came in and said, oh, this is the new government, so that's what they're going to do. Or at least I think they're going to do. The State Department and the U.S. Special Operations Forces, a new unelected and unaccountable power in the world. Experts from this new bureau are working closely with Special Operations Forces around the world, says Clinton. Our diplomats also saw that the United Nations staff in the region could be a useful partner, so they worked through our team in Washington now in, in New York to obtain new authorities for the U.N. officials on the ground and link them up directly with our Special Operations Forces to share expertise and improve coordination. And I'm just going to do this one quick article, and I'm going to move back on to this War on Terror, Liberty, Sovereignty news. The police tell Greeks not to withdraw money from banks. I meant to cover this before, and I just skipped it out by accident. Police are urging Greeks to keep their money in bank accounts rather than putting it at risk of theft, says the Guardian report. So they're, this is crazy, dude, isn't it? They're trying to prevent them from doing like a bank run type thing. But they're saying, oh, at risk of theft, that's why. So they're telling them, the IMF's telling the Greeks to pay your taxes. And then the police are telling them, don't withdraw money from your banks. So they're in bad shape. Syrian massacre, Kofi Annan, uh, to have serious and frank discussions with President Assad, right, over something that he had no, no part in, right? Syrian government denies rebel claims at massacre 110. And then it goes on and it says that, um, that, that basically the troops and Homs were pinned down inside their base for a nine-hour gun battle with attacking rebels at the time and insisted that the Hula deaths were a terrorist massacre. So, like everything else, they're getting desperate and they have to do these things. Um, kind of like uh, in NATO with the anarchist thing, the three, NATO 3. BBC News uses Iraq photo to illustrate Syrian massacre. The BBC is facing criticism after it accidentally used a picture taken in the Iraq war in 2003 to illustrate the senseless massacre of children in Syria. So, and this is all ultimately the when you know they're getting desperate, when they say, oh, the children are being... Uh, you know, killed and women and children like they care, right? Like the United States cares about the women and children as their poverty rate is at a 17-year high, right? As they're killing women and children and families in Afghanistan, Pakistan. Oh, but they they care about the Syrian children now all of a sudden. And people buy this bullshit. They do. Americans buy it. They buy it. You know, whether it's, oh, mass graves when it ended up being the rebels in Libya. And, you know, remember in Libya in the beginning, uh, it said, well, oh, that lady, oh, the the... Uh, Gaddafi's army, they raided me and stuff like that. And then basically it came out that she was lying. Just like the fake raids of, by the Syrian rebels opposing as the government, or, or the burying them alive. That was all staged. So Hula's serious stunt proves old tricks are best tricks. NATO learned from the best. So this information trickles out. It goes on, it says, it's becoming clear that the Syrian government was not responsible for sh uh, shelling to death some 32 children and their parents. Now this is the same people that are trying to get you to think that they care about children. They're the ones that are responsible for backing the terrorist groups that are responsible for it. You know, and they plan color revolutions and re get regime change, like in Egypt where they had, you know, everyone thinks that this is progress, that this is democracy spreading. Well, Egypt's brotherhood, the Muslim brotherhood that's now in there calls for intervention in Syria. So you know who they're working with, the West and Israel. Yeah, and it says that the international monitor monitors aren't doing enough. And that's the catch when I read in the comments of all those uh, the articles on the uh, UN and basically Assad, all those people in the comment boards, or at least most of them, they say what? Oh, they're not doing enough. They're a joke. UN's a joke, you know? They're asking for the UN to get fangs, basically. They want the global government to have fangs and, and just go around doing this stuff, basically killing people in the name of uh, democracy. I mean, it's like I said before, they buy it. They believe this bullshit. They believe it. It's, it's just, it's horrible, dude. So it says here that these Lebanese uh, are arming the Syrian rebel terrorists, right? Which are being smuggled through Libya, which has now been overtaken. And when they're done with Syria, they'll use that to basically go and attack Iran. But until then, Russia says Syrian opposition is massacring people to spark intervention while Russia arms shipment en route to Syria, says a report. Then the U.S. says they're ready from a military perspective uh, to stop Iran from creating nuclear weapons, while the Israeli MK says, I didn't mean to shame the Holocaust by calling African migrants a cancer. U.S. drone strikes increase in Pakistan to 31 since Wednesday, and then four more killed in Pakistan on Saturday. 
an Afghan family is killed by a NATO airstrike as this is Jujian and I'm Darko.